Hi, welcome to the first part of This Week in Tudor History with me, Claire Ridgway, author of several Tudor history books. Now today I'm going to be talking about Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey's loss of royal favour, and his children's joy at news of him returning home, an ambassador killed by the purple fever, and a chief justice who's gone down in history as the first law reporter. First, on the 22nd of March, 1546, in the reign of King Henry VIII, Edward Seymour, Earl of Hertford, landed in Calais to relieve the out-of-favour Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, in his military duties as Lieutenant General there. Hertford had been officially appointed the previous day as the King's Lieutenant in the parts beyond sea and Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Armada now about to be sent thither, with authority to invade France at discretion and to order all admirals, vice-admirals and shipmasters there. The Privy Council also wrote to the Earl of Surrey, recalling him to England. But what had happened? Why was Surrey being replaced with Hertford? Well, Surrey had been serving in the French campaign on and off from autumn 1543, and in September 1545, he was appointed Lieutenant General of the King on sea and land for all of England's continental possessions. England had captured Boulogne after a siege which ended in September 1544, but nearly lost it to the French when they attacked in October 1544. By the autumn of 1545, the Privy Council was advising King Henry VIII to let Boulogne go, but Surrey was keen for the King to defend it and to make further conquests in France. All looked good for Surrey in December 1545. Historian Susan Brigden explains that Surrey's plan was to prevent the French reinforcing the fortress of Châtillon, which she explains threatened the harbour of Boulogne and the supply of the English garrison. And English soldiers successfully ambushed French troops and prevented supplies reaching the fortress. They also set about plans to capture it. However, disaster struck on the 7th of January 1546 when the English force was defeated by the French at the Battle of Saint-Étienne. In a dispatch to Charles V, Ambassador van der Delft reported that the English had lost 1,200 footmen with eight English and four Italian captains and that the Earl of Surrey has consequently lost greatly in reputation and there is considerable discontent at these heavy losses. On the 11th of January 1546, on hearing the news of the English defeat, and receiving no report of it from Surrey, the Privy Council wrote to him. The King, understanding by private advertisements from Boulogne that Sir George Pollard is slain and that there has been an encounter with his enemies, marvels that in so many days Surrey has not signified the matter hither. Are specially commanded to require him to signify the circumstance of this chance. Just wait for Madge to me and in future to give advertisement of any such matter. The king and his council were not best pleased. On the 15th of January, in a letter to the English ambassadors, the Privy Council played down what had happened, writing, But some of our men, through overmuch courage, disordered their array, and thereby seven or eight young gentlemen were lost, among them Sir George Pollard, who was stricken on the knee with a gun out of Hardlow Castle, and died within two hours, Edward Poynings and other meaner personages. The Frenchmen will doubtless report it as great victory because in the misorder they got one or two of the captain's ensigns. Our men, however, gained their object. But as Surrey's biographer Jesse Charles notes, their mention of overmuch courage as the cause of the English defeat was ominous for Surrey. On the 18th of January, Sir William Paget, Henry VIII's Secretary of State, wrote to Surrey rebuking him for not writing to the King, but also reassuring Surrey. 
His Majesty, like a prince of wisdom, knows that who plays at a game of chance must sometimes lose. And saying, he assured that the Earl had in the rearguard of the battle placed some men of wit and experience, which, when against all order of fight and against the appointment of the chieftain, seeing the horse flee as they took it, if they so thought and fled, so are not greatly to be blamed. Surrey continued in his service, but as Jesse Charles notes, it was a wretched time for him, and San Etienne never strayed far from his mind. Susan Brigden writes of how it was at that time that he wrote two poems in a female voice, transposing his own characteristic sense of isolation and abandonment into lamentations by women parted from their lovers. Surrey petitioned for his wife Frances to be permitted to join him in Boulogne, but his request was denied. Things went from bad to worse as Surrey was kept in the dark, even being sent 1,000 sappers out of the blue. His exasperation is apparent in a letter to the King's Council. Here are arrived and coming 1,000 pioneers who will consume much victual, and we have no advertisement from you how to use them. On the 19th of February, Paget wrote to Surrey informing him that Hartford was being sent writing, the king will send an army over very shortly and my lord of Hartford shall be lieutenant general in Boulogne, whereby your authority of lieutenant shall cease. He added some personal advice for Surrey. Therefore, for your reputation, you should make suit betimes for some place in the army, such as the captainship of the forward or rearward. Thus, should you gain experience and peradventure do some notable service in revenge for the loss of your men at last encounter with the enemies, whereas if you now tarry within a wall without authority, it would be thought abroad either that you desired to tarry in a sure place or that your forwardness to serve was discredited here. If it pleased you to use me as a mean, I trust so to set forth the matter as to get you appointed to lead the forward or rearward. And this counsel I write unto you as one that would you well, trusting that your lordship will even so interpret the same. And let me know your mind herein betimes. So he was suggesting that Surrey should try and restore his reputation by serving under Hartford and proving himself. On the 25th of February, Paget reported that Surrey was indeed going to lead the rearward. So he'd listened to Paget. Sadly, though, on the 21st of March, 1546, the Privy Council wrote to Surrey recalling him. Surrey must have had mixed feelings about this. Joy at the idea of seeing his wife and four children, but concern regarding how his service in Boulogne would be viewed by the King and his council. His children were excited by news of his return, though. In her excellent biography of Surrey, Jessie Charles includes a welcome epistle that the children's tutor asked them to compose in Latin for their father. Although it was a schoolroom activity, Charles notes its childlike sweetness and touching reverence. They write of their enormous joy at his unexpected return, and how our joy is so great that the strength of this little body of mine is inadequate to express it. They call him their most loving father and the bravest of commanders who preserved the king's interests with the greatest good faith that you could have applied. I hope they had a wonderful reunion when Surrey returned. Unfortunately, when Surrey arrived at court, he was, according to the imperial ambassador, coldly received and was refused access to the king. Things, of course, got worse for him later that year, when in early December 1546, his former friend Richard Southall gave evidence against him. Surrey was arrested and accused of improper heraldry, using arms in a painting to indicate he had a direct claim to the throne. It wasn't true, and the real reason for his fall was his falling out with the Earl of Hertford. 
But the ailing Henry VIII was paranoid by this time and believed that Surrey and his father, the Duke of Norfolk, were plotting regarding the regency when the king died and his young son succeeded him. Surrey was tried for treason and executed on the 19th of January 1547. His pregnant wife and four children must have been devastated. Surrey is such a fascinating Tudor chap. He served his king loyally as a soldier and was a gifted poet. And I'd highly recommend Jesse Child's book on him. It is an excellent read. I would show it to you, but it's on my Kindle, so I can't. Moving on to the 23rd of March, and I'm taking you to the 23rd of March, 1596, in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, when soldier, member of parliament and diplomat Sir Henry Unton or Umpton died after being taken ill with a violent burning fever after accompanying King Henry IV of France to the siege at La Faire. Unton was about 38 years of age at his death. Here are a few facts about this Tudor man. Unton was the son of Sir Edward Unton of Wadley near Farringdon in Berkshire and his wife Anne Seymour, daughter of Edward Seymour, Duke of Somerset and Lord Protector and the widow of John Dudley, 2nd Earl of Warwick. Unton was educated at Oriel College, Oxford and in the Middle Temple in London. He also travelled through Europe in his youth. In 1586, he served as a soldier in the Netherlands and he and his friend William Hatton, nephew of Sir Christopher Hatton, were knighted by Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, after distinguishing themselves at the Battle of Zutphen. In 1591, Unton was appointed as resident ambassador to France. He got on well with King Henry IV, but was rebuked by Elizabeth I in 1591 for exceeding her instructions. And then in 1592, when he complained after having all his money and clothes stolen, everything but the nightshirt he had on at the time, the Queen wasn't exactly sympathetic, saying, She did both pity and yet thought strange how it should be done, you having so many servants. In 1593, he served as Member of Parliament for Berkshire, and in 1595, he was reappointed as the resident ambassador in France due to the patronage of his good friend, Robert Devereux, second Earl of Essex, the Queen's favourite at the time. His mission was to make sure that France stayed enemies with Spain. In 1596, he accompanied the French king to La Faire, where the French had the Spanish forces under siege. But he fell ill with a fever soon after his arrival, and it was described as the purple fever. I don't know what that is. The king was advised against visiting him, but decided to risk it on the 14th of March. Unton died on the 23rd of March, 1596. His body was returned to England on a black ship and he was buried in Farringdon at All Saints Church in a lavish funeral on the 8th of July. As well as being a soldier, member of parliament and diplomat, Unton was a literary patron, a diarist, a writer, writing a now lost treatise on how to be a good ambassador, a linguist and a music lover. Unton was survived by his wife Dorothy, daughter of Sir Thomas Rawton, and she commissioned a posthumous portrait of her husband. It depicts Unton at his writing table, flanked by figures of fame and death, and he's surrounded by scenes from his life. Him as an infant with his mother, him studying, his European travels, his service in the Netherlands, his embassy, his life in England, him in his study, talking to divines, playing music, presiding over a mask and banquet, him on his deathbed, his body on board the black ship, his hearse, a funeral procession going past his house, his funeral monument and his mourning kneeling widow. It's an incredible painting and I'll give you a link to see it and all the different parts of it in detail and to read about the research that's been done on the painting. It really is incredible. And moving on to the 24th of March. On the 24th of March, 1582, 
judge, law reporter, member of parliament and speaker of the House of Commons, Sir James Dyer, died at the age of 72. His other offices included King's Sergeant at Law, Judge of the Common Pleas and Chief Justice of the Common Pleas. He was buried at Great Stoughton Church in Huntingdonshire next to his wife. Dyer was Speaker of the House of Commons during the reign of King Edward VI and served as Chief Justice of the Common Pleas from January 1559 until his death. He was knighted in 1552. Dyer was the first law reporter, reporting on cases beginning in Trinity term 1532. Three volumes of his reports were published in January 1586, and these reports run from 1513, when he was actually only a child, so some were retrospective. Sir Edward Cook wrote of Dyer, a judge of profound knowledge and judgment in the laws of the land, and principally in the form of good pleading and true entries of judgments, and of great piety and sincerity, who in his heart abhorred all corruption and deceit, of a bountiful and generous disposition, a patron and preferrer of men learned in the law and expert clerks of singular assiduity and observation, as appears by his book of reports, all written with his own hand, and of a fine, reverend and venerable countenance and personage. A monument erected at his resting place in the early 17th century has an effigy of Dyer kneeling, dressed in his judicial robes and wearing his gold collar of SS, the collar of his office of Chief Justice of the Common Pleas. He is depicted along with his wife and his great nephew Richard, who was Dyer's heir at his death, Dyer leaving no children. And that's it for today. In the second part of this week in Tudor history, I'll be talking about letters patent for a famous explorer and an argument over vestments. I'll be introducing a Tudor Earl who was known for his loyalty during the Pilgrimage of Grace Rebellion and some Protestants who ended their days at the stake in Queen Mary I's reign. Please do join me then. You can subscribe by clicking around about there. You can hit the bell to be notified as these videos go live and you can give me a like and leave me a comment. I'll see you very soon. Take care. Bye-bye.